Hi everyone. So this is our class to uh, as an introduction to computer science principles. And computer science principles um, is different because we're just going to learn about some of the fundamental principles instead of the details. So from today's class, uh, you'll see it's um, it's more about the concept than it is about the execution in this class. Okay, so let me introduce myself first. So my name is Sunny. I'm 17 year old, years old this, um, this year. My birthday is December 27th. And then I go to Valley Christian High School in San Jose. Um, some of my hobbies are badminton, art, piano, traveling, and of course, programming. I love coding, um, even sometimes in my spare time. Um, so a fun fact about me, I'd say, um, is that I used to like love swimming. I used to take swimming classes until I went on a cruise and we were snorkeling with dolphins and I almost drowned and I've hated swimming ever since then. So that's a little fun fact about me. And that's my Instagram if you want to like follow me in case you have any question about this class or anything. Um, and yeah, here are some pictures, me playing badminton. And this picture was really cool. It was in Costa Rica like two years ago before the pandemic. And then we were zip lining, which was really fun in like through the woods. So we got to like zip past trees. It was very fun. Yeah. So um, yeah, I'm the teacher. And other than like these fun facts about me, I want, also want to introduce why personally I like programming and computer science. So I love, I think it's very applicable to any field. So basically, once you learn the basics, you can pretty much do anything. Um, like I said, because computer science is like such a emerging field and because um, um, I'd say it's so abstract, you then once you learn the fundamentals, it's basically like Lego blocks where you could one put one and one together and then you have this whole picture. Um, and another one, everyone uses programming. Now it's like the thing, especially if you like live in California or the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, it's so tech heavy. So it's all around you. So if you guys can think of any examples where programming can come into use, put them in a chat or a new and um, talk. And you can, sorry, you can say your example. So for example, I can go first. Programming can be seen in these days, you can see them in cars, in um, applications. Um, your phone is completely programmed. Um, and even like design, not even your phone itself, but the designing of the phone is also used with, made with programming. Um, so my dad, he's a software engineer and he, he used to do placement, which means that you use software to like design the hardware and how, to, and basically, um, optimize the best, um, like your, all the hardware in your phone, you have to place them in the optimized, optimized position so that you can like have the phone that you have now which is really cool. Yeah, if you guys uh, have anything, just uh, put it, have any ideas, put in chat. Oops, um, okay. And of course, if you guys are here, you probably know this one. Programming, because it's used so often, it's very good for future jobs. Um, for me, I'd say um, I am my specialty or I work the most in bioengineering or not exactly bioengineering, but computational biology. So me, I take large data sets in biology, for example, cell gene expression or like um, 
like the blood flow, like all those big data sets. And then I would analyze them through computer. And something else, uh, another project that I'm working on now is also I apply machine learning to like find out the best combinations of tissue culture, which basically means um, when you're like uh, raising cells, you want to give them like the best environment. And I kind of try to use machine learning and apply it to that, which is very cool. If it's something that you guys want to learn, know more about my own projects, I can also talk about that, but yeah. And last thing, new discoveries are made daily. So um, every day you can see papers come out in any field, chemistry, physics, biology, um, something else I'm missing. But if you look in papers, a lot of the methodologies they use are actually through programming because there's just more, there's more data that we need now. So the problem right now isn't with collecting more data. It's having these big data sets that we don't know what to do with. And this is where computer science comes in. And very glad you guys are taking this class. And next, um, Leon is going to introduce himself. So he is our TA for this class, kind of. And he's going to just going to be helping me with like some logistic stuff. And he'll also be like some of these slides you make, he'll also be helping with that. So, uh, so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Leon. I'm a seventh grader at Stratford Middle School. So I volunteered in uh, SVCU and Future Bridge as a coach. In SVCU, I volunteered uh, uh, and I taught origami in Future Bridge. I taught uh, financial literacy. And I enjoy folding origami, playing video games, and reading. I recently joined a robotics contest for WRO, which is the World Robotics Olympia. Very cool. Leon, what is, what is like Future Bridge and S? Uh, they're two, like, I think they're two nonprofit organizations. I'm not sure what SVCU stands for, but yeah, they're two nonprofit organizations. Cool. Yeah, so if you, if you have any questions and like you think maybe I'm too intimidating to approach or something you can ask Leon too he's um, probably around your age but that's what we're gonna find out next so um in the chat um can you guys just oh I mean your name's already there but can you put in like your age your grade like where you where you are from which some of you have already done if you've done it you don't need to do it some of your hobby or hobbies and what you want to learn in this class. And if you don't have an idea, that's okay too. So go ahead and take this time to, or you can unmute and talk, that's fine. Or I would prefer that. Um, okay, let's start with um, Sophia. Do you mind going first and maybe introducing yourself a little? Uh, sure. Hi, my name is Sophia Jang. Um, I'm 14 years old. I'm going to 10th grade and I live in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Oh. Uh, my hobbies include, well, I also play the piano and I'm a figure skater. And that's all I can think of right now. And what I want to learn this class is like, I guess, more about computer science in general because like it's like so there's so much like yeah. mm -hmm. is it is computer science something that you like want to do in the future or no that's yeah awesome. okay I mean yeah it's like super important so yes it is okay that's that's very nice New Jersey I went to New Jersey like I think two weeks ago yeah and then it was like it was like also a hundred degrees there the week I went. So like, like, yeah, it's, it's been. Very, yeah, the weather like, fluctuates so much. It was like yes. cold today. Yes, <laughs> I know. I was so shocked. I did not pack for that kind of weather when I went. Um. Okay. How about, sorry, I'm just gonna call on you guys cause you guys aren't gonna put. Um. Um. How about Eric? Mind introducing? 
So I'm 10 years old and I'm going to fifth grade and fifth grade. I was playing soccer and video games and I went to this camp because my dad and mom are computer engineers and they signed me up. Oh, okay, cool. Sounds very cool. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Eric. Okay. Um, Anna, do you want to go next? Uh, hi, I am um, Anna and I am 13 years old, about to go to ninth grade. And um, my hobbies are, um, you know, I, I'm really interested in astronomy right now. And uh, I would, I mostly just want to learn um, just like a little bit more about computer science and try to uh, program stuff. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, astronomy. Astronomy. I, a lot of my friends are also interested in astronomy. I like totally get that, even though I personally, I like know nothing about it. It sounds very cool, but it's also pretty hard from what I've heard. Okay. Um, lastly, um, James. Uh, I'm James. I am 13 and I'm going to ninth grade. Uh, my hobbies are uh, playing uh, video games competitively, uh, theater, um, crafting stuff, and uh, playing the ukulele. Cool. Ukulele. That's a yeah, good Yeah, I'm bad, though. Oh, come on. Maybe you can play for us once. No, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm just joking. You don't have to. Okay. And I want to learn, uh, like, how to create a shooter game. Okay. Okay. Yeah. We can totally do that. Um, yeah, like I said, it's pretty much periods. If you want to create some anything of your own, if I give you the basics, you can just uh, use your logic. And um, there's also special apps for that too. Okay. Um, next slide. So I really personally, I really want this to be a discussion-based class in, instead of a lecture-based class um, because I personally don't really like lectures. I think they're very tedious and boring. So instead of like a class, try to think of this as um, chatting with your friends, but one of them, meaning me, I talk a lot. Um, if you have any questions or opinions or like just statements you want to say, just unmute and type in the chat. Um, with for now, we don't have that many people. So it's, I think this is something that we can do pretty easily, hopefully. But when more people come, it's going to be more of a challenge. So hopefully, yeah. So I guess take advantage of like the smaller class for now because I don't know how long this is gonna last. Um, okay, so I want to give a little preview of what's what this these four sessions are going to be so first this whole unit is going to be from um about the internet so first it's going to be what today we're learning what exactly is the internet week next week would be internet hardware and then internet addresses and viewing websites um i think uh some of these lessons especially today's lessons would be some of the stuff that you already know, but they're going to be consolidated into a way that makes it easier for you to understand it. Like, it, I guess I really appreciate the novelty of the internet, it improved my life a lot, and I'm sure many of yours. Um, yeah, and of course, if you wanna learn more about like programming and coding like languages, um, there's, we have other classes that teach Java or um, Python, and of course you can ask home more about it. And I think I'm going to start, um, if you want me to, I can add a bit of Python into these classes, but otherwise I think one of my next session, my next four weeks or the uh, one after that is gonna be more about that too. Okay, so this is part of the AP Computer Science Principles course. If you look that up on the internet, it's um, actually a course and it's a AP advanced placement offered by College Board. And when you go into, into high school, you guys will probably take more of these. So um, 
hopefully this class will make those courses easier. It's also a college level course, which means it's what college freshmen take. So yeah, be proud of yourself that you're like a middle schooler or like a freshman taking a college level course, it's um, pretty difficult, so yeah. Okay, so our first, like I said, the first one is welcome to the internet. So what do you think the internet is and what, when can you think of some functions that the internet has? You can type them in the chat or you can unmute again. Right, when I think of like the internet, I think of like all those like big search engines where you can like look up anything and then like they give you like websites and all those answers. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, something we're very familiar with, offering answers because we're in an online um, learning environment and a lot of times I Google answers instead of listening to my teachers because I miss it. <laughs> um, okay, that's a good answer. Anyone else? What are some functions of the internet? Yep, so online learning, that's also an internet function. Um, also a lot of social media, as you guys would know, are uh, probably familiar with, that's also part of the internet. Yeah, there's um, a, a lot of functions that can do, and today we're going to um, specifically delve into those. So internet, or as this cartoon here says, it's a very important part of our lives. And we're going to be answering questions like, um, what is the internet? How does it work? And what impact has the, inter has the internet had on society? So basically the how of the internet, because we already know what it does. So I really like this cartoon because it's like making fun of the internet. You have all these like blogo blog. That was a cool um, cartoon. Okay. At its core, the internet is actually a philosophy or making information and knowledge open and accessible to everyone, like Sophia says, with those um, big search engines. As the wor world becomes increasingly interconnected, we become further able to share the wa vast wealth of knowledge with anyone and with any and everyone who has a connection. And physically, the network, uh, the internet is a network of networks, sorry, excuse me. It allows devices from all over the, the world to connect to one another. And it all works because it's built on open agreed upon protocols. Um, let me start with the bolded words. So for internet as a philosophy is a really interesting concept to me because internet is very abstract. Like you can't touch the internet, you can see it, but it's mainly just an idea. So instead of like selling a product or selling an I something that's feasible, internet is just not there in a way. So it's just ideas built upon ideas that like builds into a philosophy, which I totally love. And it's of course accessible to ev or more and more people. And like I said, there's um, so much information in the internet and most of them we have not people we meaning people haven't even anyone hasn't analyzed or um organized um we're going to talk about more what it means a network of networks um later but basically it, this is a hardware thing and i'm going to introduce this slightly to you guys now I'm gonna try drawing on Zoom on my laptop, which is going to be difficult, but here. So basically you have a, this is say, let's say this is the server and each computer is connected to a server. And that is how the internet works. So you have a server that sends signals to each of these computers and so on. And then you have servers that are linked to servers and then those are connected to more laptops or iPads or whatever those are. So yeah, so that's why it's like one network and then this is a second network. 
And we'll learn more about that um, next two weeks or one, one, one after one of these weeks. And protocol. So a protocol is a widely agreed upon set of rules that standardize communication between machines. Um, if there wasn't, then discussion between these devices would be like us speaking in different languages. Um, like if I spoke Spanish, um, maybe some of you would understand, but, um, or if like some of you spoke French to me, I would not know what, saying, what you're saying, so yeah. And protocols like ASCII, uh, which we'll, we'll, we, we will learn about that later, allows computers to uh, agree to send, store, and interpret data in the same way, enabling them to efficiently communicate. So basically, computers don't communicate the way we do. We communicate with words. And what you're seeing now is words. But the computer actually first translates these into numbers and then translates them into words. So what you're seeing right now is actually just a bunch of zeros and ones. And these zeros and ones, we call them binaries. So these computers are all binaries and they're all just stored in like 0, 0, 0, 1 and those sequences. And again, we'll learn more about that in the next few weeks. So to summarize all of that, the internet is basically just a way for all machines to communicate with each other and for us humans to communicate um, with one another through the computers. As long as two people have access to the internet, we can basically communicate across any distance. And there is, um, here, I'll go to the next slide. So like you can see from there's several X's, maybe some of them were uh, we live. And then basically we can send this information anywhere. So if you compare it to before, like as in 200 years before, before computers were invented, it would take much longer, like five times, like maybe instead of um, a second to send a um, text message, it would take, if your friend was across the coast, it would take uh, two, one month maybe to get your letter across and for them to write back would take another month. Yeah, it was uh, a hassle. And this kind of introduces the concept of, let me type it out here. Um, this is a technical term called distance decay. Or this relates to relative distance. Distance decay basically means that um, the, the time shortens between two places and relative distance. It's like, for example, physical distance would be like meters, miles, like you're three miles away from me, like those, that's, but relative distance would be like how easy it is to communicate. So the easier it is, the, it is to communicate, the shorter the relative distance is. So even though, let's say, um, a big city in China would, um, it would be further away physically from us, but compared to like a tiny village in, I don't know, South America that doesn't have the internet, relatively, um, in relatively, um, the big city in China would have a shorter relative distance. Slide. So to give you just an idea of how big the internet is, in the year 2005, 16% of the internet was online. 8% of the developing world was online and 51% of the, sorry, this is supposed to say developed and developing. Sorry about that. Okay, developed world and yeah. Okay, and now if we fast forward to 2014, 40% of the world is now online with 78% of the developed world and 
two percent of the developed. That is wait, that is sorry, those are supposed to be switched. Anyways, the point on this slide, if that was very confusing that I typed everything wrong, is that um, um, the internet is very growing exponentially. It's growing very quickly and hopefully all of the world will be online to access the same information that we do and so that we can also communicate. Please ignore some of these, but um, we're going to come back to that later. Um, the internet, again, is very big. So here we have 9,290 tweets sent, um, 88,594 Google searches, almost 3 million emails, which 67% of those are spam, and uh, 108,165 uh, gigabytes of internet traffic. And there are these statistics, but what do you think? There are these amount of stuff going on every, what do you think? Year, every month, every day, every minute, every second, every hour. What do you think? Second, okay, that's a good guess. Day, okay, um, every, um, everyone try to put your guesses in, minute. Leon, guess get, which one do you want to stick with, Leon? Our day. Um, I honestly don't know. Okay, that's fine. Take a random guess. Um, Anna. Oh wait, sorry, you already put yours in. Okay, everyone has theirs in. So, um, it's actually every second. So every second, there are like almost uh. Almost 10,000 tweets, almost 3 million emails, and that many Google searches. And it's um, a lot, honestly. So um, because I messed up those statistics, take a minute to go to this uh, link over here, www. Leon, could you maybe put in a chat for me? Uh, Internetlivestats.com. Um, and Go ahead and click on that link and take maybe uh, 10 to 15, but I'd say like five to um, five to 10 maybe minutes and explore some of the statistics on there. And for now you can, um, if you want to, you can turn off your camera and do this. But um, when we, when we come back, um, yeah, okay. So let's talk about our third question, which was the impact of the internet. So there are many, of course, impacts of the internet. It basically changed all aspects of human life. If you actually look at it before, for like the last 2000 years since uh, people have been on this earth, um, the people have been living with the same quality of life so far. But I think in the last um, 200, 100 to 200 years, um, technology and everything started growing exponentially. And that's where the quality of living started improving a lot. So yeah, the, the internet has um, created so many opportunities for us. But again, it also has created many um, downsides that new problems that we now have to deal with that are morally gray and we don't know the right answers to. So starting with the positives, we have collaboration. So people around the world can work on projects all together. Um, yeah, and you guys know this because you guys probably used um, Google Docs before, um, Google Forms, Google Drive, that's a good resource, but a lot of um, professionals uh, regarding coding, they would share through websites like GitHub or Slack. So I'm actually going to show you guys one of these resources now in case um, you want to take a look at them. So let's start from GitHub. So when you go on Git, GitHub's main website, this is um, it, very techy. Uh, where it's where um, a bunch of code and software are exchanged and 
yeah, you, I mean, there's lots of developers. You could take a minute to look at these yourself during your like break time or after class, um, exactly how to use it. But um, here is uh, one of the projects that um, I'm working on. And basically this is a link from a published paper. And if you don't know, published papers are basically um, researchers who like make a novel discovery and there's like different levels of papers they can publish to and that yeah, people look at them for like new ideas, novel ideas, everything like that. So this is one of them and this is um, on cell expression. But these are all these files and for example, there you have a tutorial that is linked here. And of course you have these like amazing, very pretty figures, but of course with pretty figures, it's not always the best analysis because it's really shallow in a way. But if you go back to this main site, you can copy all these different files into yours. So I this IPYMB, this is a file that is compatible with Python. And if you run it on like an application, for example, Jupyter Notebook or something, which I use, um, you can basically, uh, let's go in here. Yep, you can copy and paste, import, download all these modules and basically run all of these. And it's all free, you don't have to pay any money. It's, it's the impact of the internet. You get all these free resources that you can use. And, uh, sorry. And I also wanna show you something very cool just because my passion is in com computational biology. There is this Chan Zuckerberg initiative that was, that's, um, that is also from, stems from that uh, tutorial I just showed you. So basically they have all of these like workflows and different, um, different, I'd say gene expressions and cell data sets that you can use and you can run all sorts of analysis on them. And yeah, you know, they, have, they have lots of platforms and this is a new initiative that's very cool to me and I use it a lot. They have these, all these languages, Go, Python, Ruby, JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, there's also, if you want to go into data science, a very popular script language is R, um, which is like, yeah, it's a very like statistics language. Otherwise there's like more programming based languages like uh, C++ and, um, and JavaScript, HTML, and Python's like a very like easy intermediate and uh, there's another communication. This is more of a communication website. Sorry, it's called um, Slack. And basically, if you use like Discord or anything like that, it's kind of like that, except it's more, more work related and you don't have voice channels. Um, so yeah, I was thinking that we can um, add a, build a Slack for our class. If anyone has any questions or like, random thoughts that you have. It could be a very good discussion platform, but I'm not exactly done setting this up. Um, and I think I only have your parents' emails. So uh, after this class, you guys will take a survey and then you'll like answer some questions and also give me this email. Hopefully you, we can get this set up. I think that would be pretty cool. Okay, now back to our slides. Okay, so I kind of went a little bit from collaboration to communication already like with Slack. So basically no matter where you are, you can, you can get into contact with their loved ones. I have grandparents that are in China and my parents can like FaceTime them or like use WeChat to communicate with them every night. And this also includes like emails, video calls, social media and um, Yes, WeChat, our favorite that is now banned, but I, I'm not exactly banned, but like you can't update it, but that's another topic that we will soon get into. 
Uh, yeah, emails, video calls, social media, digital learning, and like we're doing now, it's also a form of communication because um, um, humans tend to learn socially. This is, yeah, WeChat isn't banned, but uh, we can't update it anymore in the US, I think. Um, okay, and then this gets a more into a bit into the con side, which is the dissemination of information. So um, basically, a dissemination of information means like how you broadcast or distribute the information, like who has access to it, um, who gets to see what it's a, it's yeah very um, it's very controversial at times, especially given the type of information that you're spreading. Um, and yes, this is another crowdsourcing is a good impact of the internet. People can come together to fund good causes. Um, you might know um, GoFundMe. Uh, yeah, those are good examples. Thank you, Mina. Um, um, so for example, crowdsourcing, we can, for uh, GoFundMe is a good website that um, of brings in a lot of money to good causes. Um, yeah, and you can also, if you don't know GoFundMe, you can start your own cause. For example, if your like family member is in need, you can like um, spread it on social media, crowdsource it and bring in all these donations for someone who really needs it. Um, this one, an anonymity, it means uh, you don't know who the person is like you don't know who you wouldn't know who you were talking to or who is talking to you. Um, yeah, it's again, for example, your username. People can choose to have their real names in their usernames or they could not. And if someone, the bad part about it is that if you like, with cyberbullying, if you don't have usernames that are distinguishable, you wouldn't know who did it. But again, there's a good component because like, uh, if you do a good cause, you don't necessarily get the reputation, you're like, you don't get um, any, so you, if people do good causes, it's because they choose to, not because of like some impact on their reputation and such. And lastly is censorship. Um, there's a lot of legal and ethical concerns about both of these topics. Censorships is a very sensitive topic in, in some places um, in China. Uh, I don't, you guys probably know like YouTube is blocked, you, Google is blocked. You can't use those at all unless you like have a special VPN and go over the firewall. It just leads to a lot of questions that people have never faced before. And yeah, if you're interested in law, that's somewhere in this area. There's also a lot of good like case studies you could look at. Look at um, if that's something you also want to look at, case like law, like legal systems and law with the internet and programming, that's also something you can look at. Um, yeah. So that's a basic summary of the impact. And later we're going to like delve into um, exactly what these mean. So yeah, it's almost been an hour. You guys can have a, you guys take a 15 minute break. If you have any questions again, if you just wanna chat, I'm here. Um, yeah, you can go use the bathroom and get something to eat. So yeah. Let's continue talking about exactly what these few things, the, these impacts mean. For collaboration, um, the internet has opened up uh, avenues for all sorts of collaboration. For example, there's this um, campaign called March for Laura, hashtag March for Laura, which crowdsourced the diversification of the bone marrow registry. So I assume what happened was um, the bone marrow is a very, um, it's very difficult to find a match for because everyone's um, bone marrow is so different. If you do not have the right bone marrow and 
uh, it is transplanted, the patient's body can reject it or like immune responses can start happening and you're basically fighting against your whole body, which you don't want. Um, and people wait on the list. If you watch like Grey's Anatomy or any of those TV shows, you'll know that um, people, um, it's you have to wait on the list for um, many years sometimes in order to find a match, which means someone is willing to donate to you or if someone like passed away and their family chose to donate the bone marrow. Yeah, and most, some people, for example, Laura, I assume they don't have that kind of time. They need it before then. So this campaign probably drew a lot of attention to um, um, what, well, her condition and people uh, requested, want, asked their doctors to test them for, um, whether their bone marrow matched, and it did. So that's a great example of crowdsourcing. Sorry, crowdsourcing. Okay, so there's other scientific programs called FODITS and Folding at Home that um, crowdsource the folding of proteins. And some of you guys might not know what those are yet. Um, but here, let me... Let me send you a link and then you can go to the Foldit website. And I think uh, it looks up, uh, it gives a pretty good job. Uh, sorry, let me put it here. It, it's a pretty good job of showing what it's all about, what proteins are and how this, this website, this crowdsourcing feature contribute to it. Um, so Foldit has players um, attempt to solve problems manually, where Folding at Home has volunteers contributing computing time, computing time to these problems, which allows exponentially more simulations to be ran than on a sing single device. So think about it like this. Um, let's talk about Folding at Home, which is the computing problem. Um, we'll also learn more about how these are ran later. It's also part of the curriculum. So for example, you have one laptop, for example, let's say playing video games. The CPU on this laptop can only handle so much before like your computer's fan kicks in, which might've happened to a lot of you guys. There's like a big annoying like fan sound. The bottom of the computer heats up. When you touch it, it's really hot. Yeah, and basically, at a certain, there's only so much one computer could do. But even if volunteers contribute, contribute their laptop or their older laptops and like this, they broke down problems into little segments and ran each segment on different computer, uh, computers and then send them back and put them together again. It's going to save so much time and with like exponential amounts of time. And yeah, it just really speeds up research. So I put the link in a chat. Let's take like not a long time. Let's take five minutes just to look at it because I personally really love this topic. And yeah, I hope you guys will enjoy it too. So go ahead and take five minutes just to read through it and look through it, anything like that. If you have any questions, um, ask me. I'm a huge biology nerd. I'm a huge programming nerd. I'm a huge ner nerd in general, so yeah. <laughs> One of my favorites, e-commerce. So online shopping is basically what e-commerce is. Online shopping allows consumers to purchase goods directly from retailers without need to get out of their home enables uh, creators who don't have funds to run a physical store to sell their wares. So for example, Etsy, as you guys know, it, um, it sells all types of different things with all types of different sellers. Um, and mo many of these products are very niche. So for example, if I wanted to sell like, um, let's say band t-shirts of my favorite band, and that's always sold, you wouldn't like, you wouldn't need to rent out a store and with like all those extra expensive, you wouldn't, wouldn't need them. Um, 
and yeah and also another one is ebay which uh uh like sells used items or like very like valuable unique items are on ebay i don't really use ebay much because sometimes it's not very trustworthy you don't know whether you're getting a fake product or if you're getting something that's actually real you might get scammed but yeah it's a good resource to have another advantage is that consumers can get the best possible deal on any product and aren't disadvantaged by their location or lack of knowledge so people can do research on these products while they're be- they're buying it like Salespeople won't be whispering in their ears trying to earn their commission and try to sell you the most expensive product. Um, um, yeah, I think that's covered everything on that. Okay, so e commerce, um, another part of it is crowdfunding. Um, so, like I mentioned, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and GoFundMe. Um, It allows people from all over to contribute to ideas or causes they find worthy of their money. Something you can do too, if you go to any of these websites, I'm sure there's like a lot of causes that need more money and yeah. Okay, so now we start to get more (laughs) into difficult content in a way which is uh, talking about the freedom of information. And there's two sides to this because there's a a vast wealth of of information and knowledge available for anyone. People can learn whatever they want on the internet through like Skillshare, YouTube, or any kinds of other scientific publications. So you don't need to be attending a research institution to gain access to high level scientific research. You can um, look up publications online. Um, If you're interested in how to do that, I can show you in like different fields. Um, For example, uh, Nature. Nature has a very big website and then you can see like black holes if you're interested in astronomy or like if you're interested in biology, you can see like like (laughs) stuff I showed you, protein folding, gene expression, stuff like that. Um, yeah, you can also learn, for example, my dad, he always fixes whatever in our house. So whenever he doesn't know how to fix something, he searches up that thing on YouTube. And yeah, it's really funny. He like fixes sinks through YouTube videos and stuff. Uh, yes, very useful. People also do online master's degrees, PhDs, um, through those two. And that's becoming more and more common. But on the other side of the coin, sites like WikiLeaks exist. There is a possible danger in classified secrets becoming public or having military plans be known to all. And that really sucks. We don't want other countries knowing our missile launch codes because they might launch our missiles and we really don't want that. Yeah, and it could also cause panic um, throughout if something that isn't supposed to be shared with the public Uh, is shared then yeah it's you can imagine the consequences a lot of panic a lot of yeah people trying to move out and stuff okay next sector is the entertainment sector again something I'm sure that we're all pretty familiar with um all kinds of entertainment are made possible by existence of the internet from streaming Netflix to Hulu to online gaming and now we have like Disney plus and HBO and all of those kinds of streaming um, networks. People have the ability to go viral on a variety of social media platforms like TikTok, YouTube, so on. And online gaming and the viewership of it, which is streaming, is an ever-growing sector. So I'm sure all of us have um, either social media or watched like Netflix or gained, right? Like Let's see, let's say, how many of you guys have streaming platforms? Anything like Netflix, Hulu, ESPN, anything? Uh, Give me like a thumbs up or raise your hand. Okay. Really, you guys don't have like those like monthly subscriptions? 
Okay, Jane's. Cool. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like those where you like um, pay like $9.99 per month or whatever they're charging now. And then you can get like access to all types of TV shows and stuff. I'm sure you guys all have it. And then of course, gaming, very, very, very popular. Uh, social media, yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, we have a bunch of memes from it. I thought this one was kind of funny. So here we go. <laughs> Um, next is the complications because there's definitely downsides um, to the freedom of information um, interchange made available by the internet. For example, access to copyright material. Um, I'm, I, for example, I'm guilty of pirating, which means that I don't want to pay for a certain movie or I can't find a certain movie anywhere and you can like search it up online and illegally access it but it's um a it's not uh a good thing to do because people uh productions lose money because of it and such like i said an anonymity uh, with usernames and like bullying and such and censorship which is you can't access certain information i think we have more slides wait. oh wait sorry okay yeah uh, let me come back. So before we jumped into those, I kind of want to uh, take this um, and like let you look into this a little bit yourself. So there was, uh, you guys have probably heard about this, but basically Twitter and Donald Trump loves using Twitter. Our former president, he, um, uh, yeah, he uses Twitter to release all, all a lot of his information. And Twitter, I think for a while, blocked him because he was saying some stuff that was really sensitive to the public. And this kind of sparked a discussion of whether social media and private corporations are allowed to restrict the access of information. So again, this is two slides. There's, I have two sources here. Um, can you guys just click on these, like from your, um, laptops and go to a link. Does that work for you? Just like give me a thumbs up. Yes or no? Okay. I'll put these in the chat then. Oh, shoot. Um, yeah, um, I'll put these in the chat for you guys and then you guys can take a look at them. Um, and you don't like, of course, this is pretty political. So I don't want to bring anyone's opinions into this. Like you can believe what you want, but just I think it's a good thing to be aware of well even though you might have different beliefs than others so yeah go ahead take um i think 10 15 minutes again to take a look at these and yeah uh try to make up your mind about uh what is the best solution to this if you were faced with this exact situation we're like testing our problem solving ability so yeah go ahead and Take a look at these links and you can do uh, more research on your own. Just search up some keywords from the articles. And if you have any questions, again, just ask me. Okay, um, hope you guys have all had a look at that. Um, yeah, I think it's a pretty interesting topic. And again, let me know if you want more resources on it or if you're more interested to talk, to talk about um, anything. And you think this is dealing with more with the legal side, so. Okay, so next, we're gonna continue talking about the con side of the internet. So one of this is access to copyrighted material um, peer to peer network allows people to share whatever content they want and oftentimes the content being shared is not owned by the person sharing it. This, you can tell this, for example, with um, textbooks because textbooks are pr uh, pretty expensive. Sometimes people just um, go to like a website that's not uh, legal and buy a uh, download it from that instead of paying uh like hundreds of dollars for it and while that that is like understandable in a way um 
we should still try to use the copywriting material because the production, the production team put their time and energy into it and it's not fair to them that we don't use the um, actual copy. Yeah, um, and another phenomenon, for example, uh, is with videos. Um, if you were to spread, if you like, if a video is posted on the internet, someone saves it, there's not any identification or like creator credits, and it just goes on and on the internet. Yeah, it gets a little like confusing where this originated from, but yeah, I, yeah. With the power of the internet, it's easier to distribute information, content that's not your own, or to gain access to things when you haven't paid for them, which we talked about. Okay, and anonymity. Uh, so a big question that arises in discussions about how the internet is how identifiable internet users should be. So for example, we want to, even though we want equity on the internet, there's also other issues that comes with this so-called equity because again, nothing can be truly equal. Um, if all users are anonymous, then users won't be targeted or discriminated against, which is a great thing. Like you don't want, like unlike in real life where there's like racism, xenophobia, on the internet, you won't know anyone's identity or like what they're, um, what they are. You un only understand what they're, you can only judge them from what they're saying and you can only judge them from their ideas, which is, um, if you think about it, it could be a good thing. But on the other side of the coin, of course, there's cyberbullying. So if all users are anonymous, then no one is accountable for their actions. For example, if um, if username one two three five was bullying someone, then uh, cyberbullying someone, then we won't know how to um, tr exactly how to uh, hold them responsible because it's just username. Of course, like experts now, we have like different ways to track them down through like IP addresses, internets, computers. Yeah all of that, but uh, it's, I guess it's a lot of um, resources that would need to be invest, invest, like invested in this cause that people don't necessarily um, have. And again, our people can be really mean on the internet if you um, ever noticed. So yeah. People, when you don't see that person, you sometimes you get the brave, the courage to like say it. Not you get the courage to say things that you really shouldn't say, and it's not really processed. You don't think of um, the other person as a human, which we should. Yeah. So that's the problem with anonymity. And the last one is censorship. So. Censorship has been a pretty big problem lately. And even things that we don't think are like censorship necessarily is, um, it is it is pretty sensitive to some people. So for example, some questions posed are, should Google display search results that have explicit or illegal content? Should government be able to filter what contents the citizens see on the internet? Um, these are not, there's no definite right or answer to any of these questions, but um, yeah, for example, even when we search in a big search engine like Google, Google can take into account of our, um, where we live, what, um, what gender we are, what age we are, that kind of shows us a biased result anyways, and that kind of also counts as censorship because a lot of people aren't aware of that. So for example, if you were to search something on Google, let's say like, I wanna search dogs. I wanna know all about dogs on Google. If the Google knows that you own a dog and you like dogs, they might show you more favorable results. But if they know that like somehow through your search history, you don't like dogs, which I don't know why you wouldn't, then it might show you like, like less favorable results, results like 
how dogs are like not a good pet or something like that. Yeah, so many people, these search results, they're, um, um, even Google, it's, it's a form of machine learning, but it's learning from a biased data set. For example, if you, the machine only can only like uh, learn from what you give it. But if you give it a biased data set, that's already not what it should be. Then again, it will also um, produce a biased uh, data. And it's this ever ending cycle that we have to break somehow. Yeah, and these questions and more are being posed by corporations and governments in discussions of how the internet should be made available for people. Yeah, so I think the important takeaway for this is that uh, there, are many, there are many problems out there that is uh, that we should be solved. Most, most importantly, we should just be aware of what we ourselves are doing and the information that we're accessing because they're not necessarily the truth. Okay, the blogosphere, or if you remember from that cartoon, it's the internet. Uh, many of our lives are impacted by the internet and sometimes in ways that we don't even recognize. And throughout this unit, we'll be learning the how of the internet and we'll be diving into deeper on the impacts on society as we know it. So like I said, we'll be learning some of like hardware of the internet and other stuff. So this is like a brief introduction to the internet. Again, like I said, it might be some things I already knew, but I hope it condensed it into a way that made it more clear for you. If you have any like questions, suggestions. Oh, wait, sorry, I have one more slide. Um, okay, this is my credit scene. So um, in honor, because we're talking about copyright and everything, I thought it only seemed fitting since I did steal some of these slides from my AP from my own teacher. So this is a thank you to my AP computer science principles teacher. And he posts all his lecture videos and very comprehensive videos um, on his YouTube channel, which if you want to go to that and learn something on your own, maybe when you're taking a course in the future, you want to have something to look back on. His username is Jeff Jacob McMillan, or there's this link that you can go to. Um, yeah. And then I also want to open the Slack so I can post these slides on there in case you want to look back on them. So I hope that's some, which is something I'll set up um, coming up next week and hopefully we'll have more people by then. So um, this is my teacher, Mr. McMillan, he also posts stuff about AP Computer Science A and A is more, instead of P, it's not more like programming based. So you'll learn about like, it, uh, arrays and all those like data storing types. If you want, if you're, if you know that you want to go into a computer science field, that is something that you should definitely look into in your spare time if you want. So go check out his YouTube channel. I'm not promoting him or anything, but uh, yeah, you'll also get tons of information on there. And we have a few more minutes left. Do you guys have? Any questions or anything I can answer right now? Okay. Um, if not, let me copy and paste this video link. Uh, let me, yeah, no, sorry, not this video link, the survey into the chat box. You can take it before you go. It's just like a um, summary. Oh, well, not a summary. It's like a, a few questions that for me to get you get to know you better and to see if any, there's anything I should improve on. Um, yeah, go ahead and take this. And if you don't have any more questions and you, um, yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, good job to everyone. That was a very long lecture. Um, I hope it was interesting to you. Um, yeah. Once you finish the survey, you can leave. And that's it for our class.